Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the various functions of the liver. Now to begin with, we need to talk about the liver itself as a structure. We know it's located in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen, and we know that it weighs around about 1.5 kilograms. Now this is around about 2% of your body weight, which is significant, obviously making it the largest organ inside of the body. Now in order for the liver to undergo its many functions, it requires a functional subunit, and the functional subunit is what we call lobules. And lobules are these hexagonal shaped structures inside the liver that do all the work. Now they're so small that they're between 0.8 to 2 millimeters in diameter, but we've got heaps of them. We've got between 50,000 to 100,000 of them per liver. So many, many liver lobules to do all that work. Now when we look at the liver itself and all of its functions, you can broadly categorize the functions of the liver under four main categories. So these particular categories are filtration and storage of blood, it includes metabolism and detoxification. It includes bile formation and regeneration. Now there's multiple subcategories of functions that fit underneath each of these, which we'll be discussing today. But these are the four broad categories that I wanna talk about when we look at liver function. So the first I wanna discuss is that of filtration and storage of blood. So the liver filters what's coming through our blood and it receives huge amounts of blood. Remember that the liver has two vessels that come into it. It's got the large portal vein, and the large portal vein is coming from the GIT. So this is a venous system draining nutrients and other particular substances, including blood from the GIT. So it includes the stomach, it includes the intestines, pancreas, and parts of the colon, and it's going to the portal vein, which goes to the liver itself. And this can be around about a thousand mils of blood. You also find that you've got the hepatic artery that also goes to the liver. And this is a branch off the celiac trunk itself. And the hepatic artery has oxygenated blood. But it's around about 300 mils of blood that's coming in. But cumulatively, there's about 1300 mils of blood going to the liver itself. And what happens is when it comes in, these two particular vessels go to the liver lobule. And I've discussed this in another video. So if you wanna have a look at the liver lobule, or portal triad video, what you'll find is that at every particular corner, you're gonna have a portal vein, or at least a branch of it, and a branch of the hepatic artery, and both of them drain into this thing called a sinusoid. And the sinusoid drains into a central vein. Now what you're gonna find, so they're both draining into this sinusoid. Now the sinusoid is porous, many holes, but it's lined by epithelia. And this epithelia plays a very important regulatory role as to what gets through and what doesn't get through. And in addition to that, there's also these macrophage cells that sit at the sinusoids and they're called cuffer cells. And what they do is they engulf bacteria, any invading pathogens, anything that shouldn't be going through. Because what happens is the fluid that's draining from the portal vein and the hepatic artery that's coming through, it moves through the pores of these sinusoids. And on the other side, we've got hepatocytes, these plate-like cells that take what's in this fluid that's moved through, and it can either metabolize them, detoxify them, use them to produce bile, for example, and so forth. So, Cup for cells and endothelial cells with the hepatocytes play an important role in filtering the blood that's coming in from the portal vein and the hepatic artery. 
Now, when we look at storage of blood, because what happens is this blood goes into this central vein, and that central vein of all the lobules come together, and that then forms the hepatic vein, which leaves the liver. Now, the hepatic vein actually merges with the inferior vena cava. And the inferior vena cava is obviously going back to the right side of the heart. So when it looks at, so that's filtration. What about storage of blood? Well, what you'll find is that the liver, while it's got a high flow of blood coming in, and that's a low pressure too, by the way, so high flow, low pressure, it can store at any given moment, or it does store at any given moment, around about 450 mils of blood. This is 10% or thereabout of our circulating total blood of the body. So it's an important storage unit. And think about this. If, remember I said, the inferior vena cava is going to the right-hand side of the heart. So I'll just draw up the heart here, for example. If there's something wrong with the heart, so an individual has heart failure, or the mitral, or sorry, the tricuspid valve that goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle is stenotic or hardened, this blood can back up and back up and back up and back up into the liver itself. And the liver can go from holding 450 mils of blood to over one liter of blood, which is quite significant. So it plays a really important role when it comes to storage of venous blood. What about metabolism and detoxification? Well, let's take a look. The liver plays a really important role when it comes to the uptake, the processing, and the distribution of nutrients. And these nutrients are going to be proteins, fats, and carbs. Proteins, fats, and carbs. And the most important point to begin with is obviously we ingest these through the food that we eat, through the whole entire digestive tract, whether it's the oral cavity breaking down carbohydrates or the stomach breaking down proteins or the small intestines breaking down fats, they all get absorbed, well, most of them, fats get absorbed into the lymphatic system, but still get to the liver at some point. But carbohydrates and proteins get absorbed through the intestines, jump into the portal vein and go to the liver for processing, storage or utilization. But in addition to that, the liver can actually regulate what's happening with those particular nutrients of other structures of the body. So for example, the liver can regulate what's happening at adipose tissue. So if I've got adipose tissue here, which is fatty tissue, right? So let's just say that a bit of adipose tissue. The liver can regulate this adipose tissue's ability to release glycerol and fatty acids. The liver can also regulate skeletal muscle and its ability to release things like lactate, pyruvate, and amino acids. You may be thinking, what about glucose? No, the stored glucose in the muscle as glycogen can go back to glucose, but it cannot leave the skeletal muscle. The only glucose that can leave a tissue and deliver itself to other parts of the body is actually coming from the liver. And that's that next point. While the liver can regulate what's happening at other tissues, it itself also plays around with these particular nutrients and can release them into the circulating blood supply to deliver to the rest of the bodies, uh, to the rest of the body. So the types of things that the liver can release includes glucose, and it can release this glucose through a process known as glycogenolysis. So glycogen is the store, stored form of glucose. Lysis means splitting apart. So when you take in glucose, the liver will store it as glycogen. If you need glucose, the liver will break glycogen apart and release that glucose into the body so that uh, structures like the brain and kidneys, for example, can utilize it. But that's not the only way that it gets glucose. It can get it through something called gluconeogenesis. And gluco 
glucose, Neo knew Genesis, the production of, the production of new glucose, we're making glucose from non-carbohydrate based sources. So we're getting this, for example, from amino acids like alanine. Alanine is one of the primary ways that we can produce glucose or, uh, through uh, glycogenolysis, but also we're doing this through fatty acids. as well. So the release of glucose, but also the liver can release acetoacetate. And acetoacetate is produced through beta oxidation. So the liver can release these particular nutrient substrates as well, which is extremely important. So the next thing we need to talk about is, why don't we go a little bit more specific and talk about the role that the liver plays for carbohydrate metabolism, protein metabolism, and fat metabolism in itself. So when we first start with carbohydrate metabolism, let's have a look. Carbohydrate metabolism. So we know that carbohydrates, they're ingested, predominantly broken down by the salivary amylase in the mouth and also the amylase from the pancreas in the intestines itself, and it's broken down ultimately into glucose. Now this glucose is gonna be taken up by the liver postprandially after we eat because it's in the portal vein and goes into the liver. Now the liver can store it as glycogen and the liver can store up to 65 grams of glycogen per kilogram of liver tissue. So that's a fair bit of glycogen that it can store. Now, if it's hit this capacity, what happens? Well, the excess glucose is turned into fat. And that fat is stored in adipose tissue. And that's an important point because when we go from carbohydrate metabolism into fat metabolism, What we find is adipose tissue is actually very poor at creating its own fatty acids and storing it. So the liver itself is the primary way to synthesize fat and store it in adipose tissue. Okay, so excess glucose can be turned into fat stored into adipose tissue. Fatty acid synthesis or taking fatty acids and glycerol, synthesizing it, so remember, what the liver can do is it can take fatty acids, it can take glycerol, and it can do a couple of things. So it can take the two, turn them into triglycerides, and that's how we store them, triglycerides, and we store them in adipose tissue. Or what we can do is take the fatty acids and glycerol and turn it into ATP and ketone bodies. Right? So one's obviously going to be storage, the other one's going to be utilization for energy. And that's that way of utilizing the protein. So what about uh, the fat, sorry, what about protein? Let's have a look. So when we look at protein metabolism, it's really important to recognize the fact that when we ingest proteins, we go from proteins to amino acids. These amino acids are in our bloodstream and get taken up by other tissues. And these amino acids from other tissues can turn into structural proteins. For example, enzymes, which are proteins that have a particular function, and hormones. Now, this is an important point, but excess amino acids go to the liver. amino acids go to the liver for processing and metabolism. And when they do this, the liver metabolizing amino acids or proteins actually release a couple of things. The liver releases ammonia glutamate glutamine and aspartate. And this ammonia needs to turn into uric acid 
or urea, which then goes into our urine and we pee it out. So the liver is extremely important in nitrogen handling. Nitrogen is made, well, amino acids and proteins are made up of excessive amounts of nitrogen and that's broken down into ammonia. The liver handles it and allows us to pee that out. And that's really important. But there's other things that the liver does when it comes to proteins. And it makes a number of really important proteins that everyone needs to be aware of. For example, coagulation proteins. So the liver produces coagulation proteins, transport proteins, the most important of which is albumin, copper and iron binding proteins, and also protease inhibitory proteins. So protease breaks proteins down and we need other proteins to inhibit them, funnily enough. So all of these are produced in the liver and are extremely important to discuss. Okay, so what we need to talk about now is We've gone through metabolism of proteins, fats, carbohydrates when it comes to the liver. What about the metabolism of detoxification or compounds that are potentially toxic? So the liver can detoxify toxic substances and this is called xenobiotic metabolism. So these are foreign particulates that are potentially damaging or toxic and it can include, include things like cigarette smoke and pollution and, all, and, and pesticides and all those types of things and the liver can manage it by detoxification and there's two phases of this detoxification. So you can have phase one which utilizes uh, cytochrome P450 which is also known as the SIP pathway. And you've got phase two, which simply takes this toxic compound and makes it a little less toxic. So something that can be handled a little bit better and hopefully can be excreted. So it turns it into a less toxic form. And that's the way that the liver deals with toxic metabolites. Now another important metabolic process is that of which we metabolize red blood cells. So importantly, red blood cells have a lifespan of around about 120 days. And obviously it's hemoglobin, just filled and filled with hemoglobin, which is heme, which is the iron portion, and globin, which is a protein portion. The globin can be recycled, it's protein. We can undergo amino acid catabolism and utilize it elsewhere. But the heme needs to be handled a little bit differently. So the heme from the red blood cells are pulled apart. They've taken away and they turn into biliverdin. And that biliverdin then turns into unconjugated bilirubin, which then in the liver becomes conjugated bilirubin. Now, an, an important thing that happens here is that the, un, the, conjugated, the unconjugated bilirubin in the liver going to the conjugated bilirubin has a couple of different pathways, for example. Now, it turns into something called urobilinogen, And the urobilinogen can go to the kidneys for excretion, or it can go to the intestines for excretion. So if it goes to the kidneys, it's coming out in your pee and is one of the reasons why your pee is yellow. And if it goes to the intestines and turns into something called stercobilin, for example, it's gonna come out in your poo and it's the reason why your poo is brown. So your liver 
plays an important role of conjugating bilirubin so it can be trans... So conjugating means basically binding it to something like proteins and sending it out so it can be excreted through the kidneys or intestines. Now what can happen is if you have liver damage, this process isn't happening. And the unconjugated bilirubin, this bilirubin can accumulate in your peripheries and it looks as though you're yellow, and this is jaundice. So when somebody has hepatitis or cirrhosis and they get jaundice as a side effect, it's because the breakdown of red blood cells, the bilirubin, is no longer being conjugated by the liver and then being redistributed, but it's going to the peripheries and the individual is turning yellow. All right, so we've done one and two. Let's have a look at bile formation. This one's gonna be quick because I've done an entire video on bile formation. And it's a little bit complex, but we're not gonna talk about the complexities here. We're just gonna talk about the very basics of bile itself. If you wanna know the details, type in bile formation in one of my videos. So, bile formation. What bile does is it emulsifies fat. Emulsifies fat. Fat is one big globule you've seen when you put oil in a pan and it all comes together. What bile does is it breaks it apart like a detergent and it forms what's called mycelles, smaller, more manageable sized pieces of fat that then enzymes in the body like lipases can chop up and turn into that fatty acids and glycerol. So that's really important. But bile in addition to emulsifying fat, is really important in the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. Now importantly, and I should have included this in the metabolism, fat-soluble vitamins are metabolized by the liver. So if they're fat-soluble, they need fat to be absorbed. And by definition, we need to ingest vitamins. We can't create them ourselves. Now, the fat-soluble vitamins is D, E, K, and A, so DECA. And we need them in our diet, and we need the bile as well that's produced by the liver, but stored in that little green gallbladder that sits underneath but behind the liver. We need that bile because it helps us absorb vitamin D, E, K, and A. So let's have a quick look at those particular vitamins and then we'll go back to bile and finish off what we we're talking about there. So when we look at these particular vitamins, what you're going to find is vitamin A. We need vitamin A in order to retinoic acid for appropriate vision, embryological development and gene transcription. All extremely important, but it's stored in the liver. And what that means is if you have too much vitamin A, it can lead to hepatic toxicity. So that's important. Hepatic toxicity, too much vitamin A. What about when we look at something like vitamin D? Vitamin D is extremely important for calcium and phosphate homeostasis. And what you'll find is that one of the vitamin D synthesis steps occurs in the liver. One of those steps. So that's extremely important. What about vitamin E? So when we have a look at vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, well, I don't need to write that down, but it's a potent antioxidant, the liver ut utilizes this antioxidant activity for lipid, peroxi lipid peroxidation and being able to deal with free radicals, which is oxidative stress. So the liver utilizes that because obviously it plays an important detoxification role. So it utilizes the metabolites of vitamin E. And then last one, vitamin K. So vitamin K is required for coagulation. Its metabolite is important for co the coagulation factors. And what happens in regards to the liver is it utilizes vitamin K to make particular coagula coagulation factors like uh, coagula coagulation factor two, coagulation factor seven, coagulation factor nine, and coagulation factor 10 through vitamin K. Now, last thing when it comes to the vitamins is that the liver does also play an important role with handling the B vitamins as well, and utilizing their particular metabolites. Oh, 
as cofactors, I should say. But let's go back to bile. So the liver makes this bile, it's important for emulsifying fats in the small intestines, it's important for absorbing those fat soluble vitamins as well. And it's made up of bile, is made up of water, it's made up of ions, so ions like sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride, things like that. It's made up of, made up of bile acids. It's made up of um, cholesterol, that's important, phospholipids, and proteins, all extremely important. All right, regeneration. The liver plays a really important role in its own regeneration. The liver is such an important structure, and we know it's important because of all these roles that it plays, and as we've spoken about as we've moved through, if the liver becomes dysfunctional, you can have a number of issues. You can have storage issues of blood and portal hypertension, Issues with being able to filter out bacteria or infections, metabolism issues, so handling proteins, fats, carbohydrates, detoxification issues of xenobiotic compounds, the formation of bile and the emulsification of fats and the absorption of vitamins, and now regeneration. So somebody through hepatectomy, so the loss of up to 70% of their liver, they can regenerate, which is amazing. And it happens really quick. So if in mice, for example, they can regenerate up to 70% of their liver in seven days. And this is extremely important and shows that it is such an important structure that it has developed or evolved the capacity to regenerate, which is obviously very important. So what we've gone through is a lot, the four overarching functions of the liver, and hopefully it all made sense.